Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Paul is now going to say to the church some really simple things, but things to, to warn them. As he's going to, he's closing this letter. Now, in this letter, guys, he is, he is never been to Rome yet. Yet, the first thing he does is say, um, I commend to you this sister, Phoebe, that you would, you would, um, you know, she was a servant, he says, at the church of Centuria. Centuria, the only place we have what, in the book of Acts, Paul passes through that place on a second missionary journey. And the only reason I remember this is that in, in Acts 18.18, um, 18, he, he gets a haircut in that town. That's the place where he took a vow. It says he was, he was taking the love gift back toward Jerusalem. And for some reason, he made a vow to the Lord. And in their culture, you know, when they made the vow, they would shave the hair of their head all the way down and, and, and offer that to the Lord and say, okay, now it's, it's like kind of like new, new goings, you know, new beginnings. With it. I, I vow I'm going to do this, and here. And they, and so I don't know if she was the hairstylist that cut his hair or what, that Phoebe gets mentioned, you know, because she was one of the ones at that place. And she's mentioned right here. Paul says, I commend her to you. So he's obviously sending, uh, well, I know because I read ahead, but he's sending a group of fellows and, and perhaps this sister to bring this letter. Remember, there was no postal mail. Somebody had to hand deliver this letter. And so he says, here's the, the, the servant who's, who's bringing the letter to them. I commend her to you. And then he says, and he says in verse 2, that you would receive her in the, in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and that you would help her in whatever manner she has need of you. Notice, you know, it's a, it's a nice thing to hear, you know, Paul, the apostle, saying, how would you like to have Paul write something about you in the Bible? I mean, like honorable mention, really good person, serve the Lord, help them out whatever they need. Works for me. And says, so she herself has also been a helper of many as well as myself, he says. She's helped me as well. And so then he goes on, he says, and greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Priscilla and Aquila were the two that he met that, that had the same occupation as Paul. You remember, what did Paul do to, to supplement or, or provide his income? Did he take offerings from churches? No, he made tents. A tent maker. He would, and, and Priscilla and Aquila, he, uh, Aquila, this is a husband and wife. We read about them in the book of Acts. I'm just summing up. This is the, I won't go into detail on the rest, I promise. But these first few... You know, they have a little bit more about them. Paul actually, Paul actually spends some time teaching them about the Lord, things that they didn't know about, and acquainting them with, with the grace of God through Jesus. And these guys, these guys, um, they become really, well, they become mighty instruments in the, in the work of the Lord in the book of Acts. They were from Rome, but they were Jewish. And they, they, they actually had to flee because they said, all Jews, get out. And so they're also Italian Jews, so I kind of picked up, you know, like, hey, poor guys, Priscilla and Aquila, get out. And so they, they fled. And because of their fleeing, God orchestrated a, you know how he kind of sets up the little dominoes to make us intersect in life with certain people? This is what he did with these two. He put them right into Paul's path. And they got to come to salvation in a, well, in, in a deeper understanding than they had already. And so Paul says, these two risk their lives, their own necks, he says, and to whom, he says, do I give thanks, but also not just me, but also do the churches of the Gentiles. Because these two went on and really started sharing about the faith that we get to have as Gentiles in Christ. And so then he says, and also he tells them to greet the church that is in their house. Now Priscilla and Aquila, 
Remember, they didn't have church buildings back then. They did, they did church in the home. You know, when we get rained out, by the way, that's what we do. We go to my house. And some of you are like, oh, you poor thing. It's like such a strain. You have the church in your home. But you know what? In the early church, that's all they did. They went from house to house. And they, and they enjoyed they enjoyed that. There's something sweet about having church in a home. It's different than having it like in a building or, or even, I mean, I got to admit, we have the best wallpaper. But, but this is, you know, but from my house, you can look at from my lanai and see this. Actually, I look right down. We, we know what the weather is down here because we just, we live right over there on the hill. And we look down and we look at it and go, okay. If it's raining, we can see from the house. If I can't see the old airport because it's all hazed out, I'm like, it's raining. Don't have to come down to check. So we, you know, there's just that sweetness. That, now, these two had a church in their house. And church is not a building. Jesus said, where two or more gather in my name, there I am in the midst. All churches is about is us gathering in the name of the Lord. Whenever we come together, that's church. And you can do that in your home with other believers. You can do that just, you can be out here on the beach. Doesn't matter where you are, as long as, as, long as you just do it in his name. So Paul says, now greet them. Then he says, um, greet Epiphanet, uh, this guy is a hard one, Epen, Epianetus. Well, say Henry, she says, my beloved. He was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary also, who worked hard for you. Greet Andron, and I could say this last night, and I, I'm tired, Andronicus, that's right. And Junus, I got no sleep last night, so this is going to be a rough one. He said, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding amongst the apostles, who are also in Christ, he says, before me. Greet these men that have been Paul recognizes they've been in the Lord longer than he had. And he says, and, and, and grant, uh, greet, uh, say that again, amp, amp, help, Ampliatus. Does anyone know anyone named Ampliatus? No. I don't. <laughs> anyway, he's in the Bible where she is. I don't know. Why they name George and Henry? <laughs> yeah, she says, why don't they name him George, Henry, John, you know? Nah. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, Statius, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those that are the household of, of, of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus and, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphania and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Paris and my beloved who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Ruf Rufus, a choice man in the Lord. That one's an easy one. Also Rufus's mother and mine, he says. Now this is interesting. He says, greet Rufus's mother and mine. Do you think Rufus's mother is really his mother? Do we have any record Paul's got a brother named Rufus? No. But this brings up an interesting point here. He calls Rufus's mother his mother. Just like, where's Angie? My mom, she was just here a second ago. Where are you, Angie? There she is. No, nope, she's right there by the table. That's my mom. Don't we look alike? <laughs> right, Angie? <laughs> this is my Hanai mom. See, this is one thing that this really points out to me. Paul is naming all these different names. Brothers and sisters and mothers. That he's calling this other fellow's mother his mom. And it, it reminds me of when Peter, both in Matthew's Gospel and Matthew 19... 29, but in Mark 10, 29 is better. I like it. M Mark got all his information from Peter. Would you just turn there for a second? Let me show you something. What Peter, this is amazing. Peter says to the Lord, he's hearing the Lord talk to the, to this rich uh, ruler and the, and, and the guy, um, he's kind of like going, what do I have to do to get saved and, and uh, to have everlasting life? And, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? This is Mark 10. Verse 18, he says, why do you call me good? He says, there's no one good except God alone. And he says, don't you know the commandments? He says, uh, you know, don't murder, don't, do not commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. He starts quoting them, you know, the, what we call the Ten Commandments. He, he says, and um, 
don't defraud, honor your father, your mother. And th listen to what this young man says. He says, to the, he, he says, teacher, really in Hebrew he says, rabbi. Rabbi, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And this was, this is a good guy because I didn't, I couldn't say that. You know, but he, in looking at him, Jesus, it says, felt a love for this, this young man. He says to him, he says, one thing you still lack. Go sell all that you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And it says, and then Jesus said, and come and follow me. And it says, at these words, the young man was saddened. He went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, he said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And, and the disciples, they were amazed at the words of Jesus. They answered him, uh, you know, Lord, what, what are you, you know, and Jesus answers again. He says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then they, they were even more astonished. They said to him, then who can be saved? And, and, and look, looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible. But with God, this is the important part, with God, how many things are possible? All things. Can God put a camel through the eye of a needle? Now, I have heard teachings where the, the guys go, the eye of the needle is a gate in the city. What is a real small gate, what a man has to, has to bend down low and it's narrow and it's to cause him to be in a vulnerable position so that, that if he's an enemy, as he's passing through the wall of the gate, they can just, you know, stab him out of a little porthole or something and, you know, kill him. But um, if he's humble and penitent and, the, you know, it's kind of the, the, the Indiana Jones, only the penitent shall pass kind of thing, you know. They said, well, you could, couldn't really get a camel through the gate, the eye of the needle, because it has all that, the load that it has on. So you'd have to take off all the load. And they give this really great teaching about how the rich have to lay aside all their riches and get down the camel on all four little legs and go all the way through the little crawling, through the little eye of the needle gate. That sounds really spiritual and everything. But if you look it up in Greek, when he says the eye of the needle, he's not talking about a gate. Guess what he's talking about? A needle that you sew with. When they heard his words, if it was just a gate that you had to get the camel, take off its stuff and get him through, they wouldn't be so amazed. They'd be like, ah, oh, it's a pain, but we could do it. But they, their answer was what? How can you be saved then? I mean, a camel through an eye of a needle, it just can't, their, their mind's blown. We can't do this. And he says, that's right, with men, can't do. It's impossible. But with God, how hard is it for God to take a camel and do it like in the cartoons, you know? <laughs> Can you just picture it in your mind, you know? <laughs> Special effects, easy, right? Just camel over here, needle here. Camel goes shoo, shoo, hair by hair through the needle, pops out on the other side and back. Reassemble. Ta-da! Camel. With God, it's not impossible. With us, it's impossible. But we serve a God that can do the impossible. So it's no big deal. Now they're just, they're just like scratching their head going, oh. And the rich, they, I'm sure that they saw the reaction of that rich young man going, whoa, this is, you want me to sell everything and give it to the poor and come follow you? I mean, and he went away saddened because it's like, I can't do it. And Jesus is saying, it's hard for someone who's rich to come follow him, to leave those riches and, 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 and put their perspective on something Longer, longer run, eternal. Now, someone who doesn't have much to the poor, the gospel's easy. I mean, in fact, this is a great message of hope. We're poor now, but we won't always be poor. Right? In my father's house, Jesus said, there are many what? Mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. Man, when you're poor, you're thinking, I got a mansion waiting for me. That's the message of the gospel. That's pretty good. But when you own a bunch of mansions, and you're told, oh, yeah, get a mansion, but, you know, I already got a bunch of them. 
What's the big deal? And I need a savior for what? Well, save me from what? I can buy my way out of anything, you know? I mean, to the really ultra wealthy, it doesn't seem like they have the same problems we have, do they? And Jesus said it's hard for them to perceive that there's still a need for their everlasting salvation. Their soul still needs saving. But to someone who experiences need every day, when you say to somebody who has grown up poor and they have suffered need day in, day out, and you say, hey, by the way, you also need a savior for your soul, they go, yep, I can relate to that. Because they're used to relating to other needs that they have. And so Jesus says, look, it may seem impossible with men, but this is, this is possible with God. And then Peter piped up, verse 28. He Peter said, no, you know Peter, right? Wet socks, Peter, open mouth, insert foot. He's always saying something he shouldn't say. And this time he says, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. We're so spiritual. Me and John, Andrew, we all, we all like join the club. We're, we're the ones that had left everything. We're, we're with you, Lord. And, and, what, and, and Jesus says, truly, I say to you. If you have a King James Bible, it says, verily, verily. Verily means truly, by the way, just in case. Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and farms, Along, he says, with, oh, I wish you wouldn't have put this in. Did you see that? Starts with the, the P word, right? Persecutions. And in the age to come, he will receive what? Eternal life. But many, Jesus says, who are first will be last, and many who are last shall be first. Now, a lot of people know the last shall be first, first shall be last part. They just don't know the verse before that. That in this life, Jesus, you know, Peter's going, we left, it, we left it all for you, Lord. And Jesus goes, I tell you the truth. There's nobody that has left house, mother, brother, sister. I mean, the whole family gamut. There is nobody has left any of that stuff that will not receive back in this life a hundred times more. And notice he does say, houses, brothers, sister. You left the house to serve the Lord? Or he goes, I got you. You left mothers, brothers, sisters. I got you. And you know what's really sweet? When I look at Paul, what he's writing here, he's saying, greet, greet Rufus, that choice man in the Lord, and greet his mother and mine also. He just got an extra mom. In fact, he's got mother, brother, sister. Look, I mean, here in his greetings, he's greeting all these different names are people. And if you don't know this in, in, in your Christian faith yet, one of the coolest things about our Christian faith is that we get, we get to have extra family from the Lord. And you know what's kind of cool is some of you are going, thank God, because my family, <laughs> my real family, the one I was born into, yeah, they're messed up. And you didn't get a choice about them, right? You were stuck with them from birth. you just like born into you like, God, why did you let me be born in that family? You know, we got some real broken eggs, sir, you know. There's some, I, I can't use some of the verbiage that comes to mind. But, you know, you get the idea, right? We don't, we don't choose the earthly family we're born into. One of the sweet things about being in the Lord, though, is that God goes, you know what, if you leave even your earthly family to come follow me, and some of you have had to do that. You had to say to your earthly family, look, I'm going to go follow the Lord. And, and you got mocked. I know I did. When I, when I first came to the Lord, my dad was like, son, you're wasting your brains following God. You, you know, you need to become a, a doctor, a lawyer. Or, you know, he wanted me to be one of those prominent positions in life. And I said, well, dad, I'm going to be a, a preacher. That was like, Boo, you know, especially when you're not following the Lord. That's not. Now, later he would come to Christ, and then all of a sudden I was okay. 
Not great, though. Doctor would have been, doctor, preacher, maybe that would have been okay with him. I don't know. But not just some guy sharing the gospel all the time. I mean, come on. Couldn't you do something more with your mind? You're just, you're just letting it go to waste. And I'm thinking, no. This is the greatest thing I could do with my mind. Is Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.